Hi, I'm Ann Dang, a Canadian physician assistant, and I run the blog CanadianPA.ca. I have the opportunity to interview Kirsten Lamola, a former military PA who has transitioned to a civilian PA practice. She now works as a neurosurgery PA in Alberta. Did you have the intention of it becoming a PA when you entered the military? Um, that was around the time that they were just creating the PA profession. I joined in the late 80s. Okay. Um, and so it was still at that point in time not really um, a big thing as it is now uh, becoming. So it was still fairly, fairly new at that point in time. So how long were you working in the military for uh, as a PA? I graduated in 2009 mm -hmm. um, and I retired five years after that. Okay. And um, what kind of work were you doing between then and uh, when you graduated? I wound up actually t doing clinical medicine for one year. Okay. And during that year, I was also tasked back to the medical school and board in Ontario uh, to help teach on various medical courses. I then wound up um, a, a year after graduation teaching on the PA program through the military. And so I taught for a total of three years between medical technicians and the PAs. Uh, and then I took a tra transfer to Edmonton for my last two years. Um, and deployed overseas during that time frame. Or what, what did you enjoy? What was difficult about working as a PA in the military? Um, I think it was the challenge was, you know, we, were, we had a double role in the military. Mm -hmm. um, at that point in time, we were also um, senior uh, medical personnel within the rank structure. And so we weren't just doing medicine. We were also doing a lot of administrative jobs. And I understand that's changing soon. Is that correct? I believe it has already changed. They are now commissioned officers. They are no longer warrant officers. They are now hold a commission from the Queen. Um, and that was part of the process that will um, change what their dynamics are. The problem with the PA program in the military at the time that I became a PA was that in order to reach certain ranks, you had no choice but to be a, P a PA. And there were people who didn't want to be a PA, but they wanted those ranks and they would be good at those ranks. So this was part of our process to, to develop the PA profession through the military. So what does that mean um, in terms of your responsibilities in day to day now that you guys are commissioned? Um, they take more of an officer role, so they'll be, um, uh, in the past, it would be the warrant officer would help mentor a captain, for example. Now, the captains will have uh, non-PAs helping to mentor them. Right now, most of the PAs are people who have been in the military for, for you know, about 10 years or longer that hold yes. their commission. Um, but in the future, you will see direct entry PAs um, being allowed in. And this is a way that will allow us to further expand our PAs through the military. So does that mean civilian PAs can potentially um, enter, civilian trained and civilian practicing PAs can enter the military potentially? without having to become a medic first? Probably at some point in time that will happen. There are a few steps that uh, my understanding that the military is going to have to um, do. And part of it is because part of the PA program in the military is specific to military that the civilians don't get. And there'll have to be a bridging program that they'll put into place at some point. At some point. Yeah, that, that would be my understanding as well. I actually talked to one of your uh, colleagues uh, recently. He walked me through just what you, what you guys do in um, military training and uh, PA school. And some of, some of the stuff that you cover is quite fascinating. So, uh, yeah. And I understand dentistry is also a part of that as well. That's right. Um, when we are stationed on things like the ships, um, the North Pole, uh, you are the senior medical person on those places. And in fact, uh, I did seven months at Canadian Forces Station Alert during my time in between teaching at the school. And I did wind up having to do about uh, four emergency dental fillings up there. So, you know, you're not going to send somebody down on a flight just to get a filling. So you have to be able to do those kinds of things. Uh, you're working in a civilian setting right now. Uh, was it uh, your decision to decide to leave the military? Uh, I was kind of at a crossroads in which I had to make a decision. Um, I was facing a promotion that would 
not allow me at that point in time to continue on um, doing a lot of clinical. It was going to be more of administration. And I have some children that, you know, are in their later years of schooling and I wasn't willing to move them again. And so I, you know, it was, it was, I was, I was at a crossroads where it was time to um, either find a civilian job or stay in the military for another 15 years at that point in time, which um, I was fortunate enough to find a civilian job. This was prior to getting involved with the PA pilot project in Alberta? Actually, I was the last, one of the last layers of the PA uh, administration project. Um, when they were initiating it, um, there were some positions that were not being able to be filled, and so they reallocated the funds to other departments. And fortunately enough, the department that hired me uh, managed to scoop the last of the funding. Great. And what, what was involved uh, with that? Uh, well, it actually is a unique story because um, I actually, I knew I wanted to go into something surgical. Mm -hmm. and I really was looking at the general surgery or orthopedic surgery. Unfortunately, because my husband is retired, I was not willing to take a job, get out and take um, risk not getting a job. So I wasn't retiring until I had a job. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't get the other two positions that I applied for and um, was called over the Christmas holidays and said, neurosurgery is looking for a PA. Would you be interested in meeting with them? They have no funding, um, mm -hmm. but it would just be a meeting. And so I said, I'd be willing to meet. So they forwarded on my resume and called me back and said, yeah, they love your resume. They'd love to meet you. And they told me the name of the head of the department. And ironically, his name is Dr. Aronic. He actually saved my middle daughter's life in 2003. So when he saw the resume, he actually had no idea mm -hmm. at that point in time putting the connection together until we met for the interview. Um, and so they went in, did an interview, discussed how PAs could potentially benefit their department. Um, and the next morning, they managed to find funding through the demonstration project, and I was offered the position. So had the physician had experience with the PA prior to you coming on? Uh, so Dr. Ronick had. He trained in the U.S., so he had dealt with some PAs down there. And he actually had been um, advocating to get PAs here in Canada for a, or in Alberta for a significant amount of time. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the partners in our uh, department have also trained in the U.S. and had really seen some successes down there. So they were quite interested in having a PA. How did you find the transition in terms of integrating you into civilian practice? Uh, the first couple of months were quite uh, challenging, mm -hmm. um, partially because the residents that I was working with um, had never worked with a PA before. Mm -hmm. um, none of them had trained in the States, so they had really didn't even know what, what a PA was going to be about. Um, the demonstration project had actually done a lot of legwork in educating both the nurses and the physicians into what we could and couldn't do. Um, and so after we, and then of course there was the big steep learning curve about neurosurgery, which was very, I guess it came down to the fact that their attitude was this was going to work and they were going to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, this particular department had already had a international medical graduate as a hospitalist. They had also had a nurse practitioner prior to me and had found with those two individuals um, it actually hadn't worked. So they were really, they needed somebody, but they weren't quite sure how this was going to fit in. And so they were very determined to uh, find solutions to make this a, a successful endeavor. What kind of orientation did you receive when you started the job? I spent the first month actually uh, working alongside Dr. Ronick um, for a majority of the time, uh, and then slowly was integrated in with the residents. I would join them on morning rounds, um, get to see all the patients. I'd shadow the chief and one of the senior residents on consults, um, and then just um, you know, shadowing in the OR and, you know, just learning some of the skills that they needed me to have. How long did it take, did you, would you say, before you start to, felt, to feel really comfortable with operating a little bit more autonomously? A matter of over time, I um, managed to realize that there was really such a big void when you're dealing with a surgical specialty and that the residents, you know, a lot of their time has to be learning skills in the operating room. And so, you know, you really learn quickly that so in neurosurgery, um, you know, we deal with people a lot of the times, um, they aren't having the great outcomes in their family situations. So, you know, their loved one has a glioblastoma or 
Gord Downey tumor, um, you know, and, and the life expectancy is very poor, or they've had a devastating trauma that has now left their 20 year old uh, confined to a wheelchair and, and mentally incapacitated. And so, you know, we do spend a lot of time with the families just being able to help guide them through what the next steps are going to be. And um, I would probably say I spend about 20% of my time counseling these okay. families. Um, what are you spending in those other times? The majority of my day is spent on the wards. Um, and I have probably between 30 and 50 patients, depending on the time of year, the workload, how many staff are around. Um, and so I spend a majority of my time just doing general hospitalist type of role. Mm -hmm. I do certain first assist um, when we are short residents um, and so that can be you know one day a week to two or three days a week just depending on what the load is for re for residents that are available yeah. consults only on Fridays and that's the academic day for the residents um, and then I spend the rest of the time um, just basically studying reading you know trying to keep uh, those things up Mm -hmm. uh, do you do any procedures? So majority of the drains uh, I do, um, removing of drains, um, whether it be for a back or external ventricular drains, subdural drains, those sorts of things, lumbar drains. I'm now in the process of transitioning into learning how to do, how to put in an EVD, an external ventricular drain, um, and I'm learning how to do uh, lumbar drains, which is a huge part of what we do. Uh, we're one of the few neural units that actually has its own ICU, and we have our own intensivists that run our ICU, um, and so we're starting to, to transition into learning how to do central lines and um, art lines and things like that that are required for them. What difference have you noticed, or what difference has the hospital noticed since adding you on to the neurosurgery service? Um, you know, very similar to to the, the study that was done out of, I believe it was Sunnybrook with the general surgery team. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing fewer uh, surgeries being canceled just because I'm able to free up the beds earlier in the day. Um, faster discharges. We've seen a decrease in the amount of complaints that have come from the families just because there's been somebody that's able to actually sit down and talk with the families and guide them through the process. The overall coverage that's going on, the nurses are finding their, their uh, demands are met easier because there's somebody that's able to actually get onto the wards way sooner um, than the residents can. And um, do you find the job fulfilling? It's an extremely stressful job because okay. you don't get very many good outcomes. Um, you know, most of our cases are people are dying of brain tumors, um, you know, horrible traumas. And so when we get those nice, good guy walks out of the hospital, we really, we really hold on to those. The most fulfilling part about this position um, really is the team that I work with. I work for 12 neurosurgeons, mm -hmm. uh, three are pediatrics. I don't do pediatrics, but the, the pediatric neurosurgeons do adult uh, procedures. Mm -hmm. um, and they are an extremely supportive, close-knit, um, really good group of surgeons. Uh, the nurses, social workers, uh, um, our nurses' aides, you know, the unit clerks, they are just a phenomenal, great team. And everybody has everybody's back. And I found that that transition from going from a team in the military to a team in the civilian has really made that transition way, way easier. Do you have any suggestions for anybody that's interested in maintaining work-life balance while working in neurosurgery? Anybody who's interested in any of the professions that have those sort of uh, outcomes, you know, palliative care, oncology, um, neurosurgery, even, even just working in pediatrics, because they, just the nature of them can be quite stressful, you need to find a way to disconnect from work. And um, some of that can be, you know, throwing yourself into your family and your family's activities, um, or it could be, you know, just taking an hour just to unwind, you know, have a bath, glass of wine, um, go for a run, you know, but it's being able to actually turn off your brain and being able to realize that, okay, I'm not at the hospital, so I'm not talking about the hospital. And when it's weighing too much, when it's mm -hmm. weighing, you find the people to talk to, you know, because it oh, can yeah. be tactical. Um, so uh, it sounds like you're not originally from Alberta, are you? 
No, I'm actually from British Columbia originally. Pretty much lived from one end of the country to the other over my military yeah. career. And so um, we chose to come back to Alberta because of the uh, healthcare supports that it offers our, our one child. How do you find the environment with regards to welcoming PAs? Extremely warm, warming. Um, you know, I think initially there was a little bit of resistance um, from people who didn't know what we did. Um, but uh, there's been a lot of advocacy, um, talking to people, explaining what we do. And in fact, I've just been invited to um, a, my third conference to speak to another group of nurses to speak about PAs. And so the word is getting out there that we're here and we're a tool to be able to be used. Um, and, and so I think... It's been very um, welcoming for the most part. Are there, is there a big supply of PAs over in Alberta? No, uh, I think some of the PAs we are getting are from Manitoba and Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, I think our supply will increase um, when and if they ever open up a school here. <laughs> it has not been finalized yet. Uh, the interest is there. I've had a few PAs. Uh, or a few potential PAs get a hold of me to, to shadow me at work, to, to find out about what the profession is. I get a lot of questions from nurses who are very interested in um, eventually being able to become PAs. So I think the interest is there. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of getting us to the point where we have a school here. Yeah. Is, uh, is Alberta regulated? The regulation piece has been um, approved in legislation. Okay. Uh, that was an easy sell. What we're waiting for now is all the policies to be finalized by all the interest parties, the you know, Medical Association of Alberta, uh, the nurses, the pharmaceuticals, all of them having a look at it, and then having it go back to Parliament for finalization. Um, in the last piece that I've been told is we're expecting that to be finalized this year. Uh, how are you involved in PA advocacy? I'd like to be involved even more in PA advocacy. I mean, mm -hmm. I really do in our profession. Um, I think... It's just finding those opportunities to actually get out there and talk to people. And so I believe that the more we educate people, the more we educate our patients, our families, um, other medical staff, the more we can advocate for ourselves. And so, you know, there hasn't been much work to do in advocacy in Alberta. Um, but, you know, I'm often talking to my friends who still live out in BC and encouraging them to go to their members of Legislative Assembly to fight for PAs, um, because I think we have a lot to offer across the country. Great. And um, that, you actually answered all of my questions. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add or um, anything else that we, we didn't cover? We've got a We've got interesting times ahead of us. Absolutely, absolutely.